I ran across a video recently that I would like to make some comments on. This is from Book of Mormon Central, and they have described the Book of Abraham. And as I watched this quick 15-minute video, I realized some of the apologetic strategies on the Book of Abraham. They just recently recorded this, apparently, and they are deceptive. And so what I want to do is I want to share several clips from this video, and I will directly respond to each one of these clips. Bear with me. This is my first recording I've ever made, but I'm going to be direct, succinct, and to the point. LDS apologetics is fatally flawed because it's deceptive. The Book of Abraham is unique in the scriptural canon of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because it is the only book in that canon that has pictures. Since 1842, when it was first published, the Book of Abraham has been accompanied by three facsimiles that illustrate the text. Joseph Smith, the founder and first prophet of the church and the translator of the Book of Abraham, provided explanations for these facsimiles that have also appeared in each reprinting of the text. In Joseph Smith's day, the discipline of Egyptology, or the study of ancient Egypt, was in its infancy. Nearly two centuries later, Egyptology is a thriving academic field that has made significant progress in understanding the culture of ancient Egypt, including its art, iconography, religion, and language. Naturally, many people have been curious to know how Joseph Smith's explanations to the facsimiles of the Book of Abraham hold up in light of scholarly advances. They're slick. They have fantastic musical background. They have wonderful graphics, etc. But yes, we are curious to see how Joseph Smith's explanations hold up with current Egyptology. So let's continue on. The question of whether or not Joseph Smith's explanations to the facsimiles are correct may be more complicated than it initially seems. This is because over the years, scholars have offered a number of different ways to understand the facsimiles and evaluate Joseph Smith's explanations. So before we can determine if his explanations are correct, we first need to agree on our starting assumptions. And he is entirely correct here. Some of the more common approaches that have been articulated over the years for studying the facsimiles include the following. 1. The facsimiles were original to Abraham. To interpret them, we should look to how Egyptians in Abraham's day, or Abraham himself, would have understood them. 2. The facsimiles were original to Abraham, but were modified over time for use by the ancient Egyptians. The facsimiles we have are much later and altered copies of Abraham's originals. To interpret them, we should consider the underlying Abrahamic elements and compare them with how the Egyptians understood these images throughout their history. 3. The facsimiles were first connected to the Book of Abraham in the Ptolemaic period of Egyptian history when the Joseph Smith papyri were created. To interpret them, we should look to what Egyptians of that time thought these drawings represent. 4. The facsimiles were first connected to the Book of Abraham in the same time period as the papyri, but to interpret them we should look specifically to what Egyptian priests who were integrating Jewish, Greek, and Mesopotamian religious practices into native Egyptian practices would have thought about them. 5. The facsimiles were connected to the Book of Abraham in the Ptolemaic period, but to interpret them we should look to how Abraham's descendants, meaning Jews or Israelites living in that era, would have understood them. 6. The facsimiles were never part of the ancient text of the Book of Abraham, but instead were adapted by Joseph Smith himself to artistically depict the ancient text he revealed or translated. And you'll notice that the seventh one that they don't include at all is that Joseph Smith just simply invented this Book of Abraham from the papyri. Now, notice the interesting shift that apologetics has taken in the provenance of the papyri and what time era that they are beginning to focus on. In order to defend Joseph Smith, they have to ignore what Joseph Smith said about the papyri. They were written by Abraham's own hand upon papyrus.
That is what Joseph Smith said. He not only said that, he taught it to all of his followers. The Cowdery's, the Pratt's, Frederick G. Williams, W. W. Phelps, etc., Wilford Woodruff. Joseph Smith said these papyri were 4,000 years old. Wilford Woodruff said that they had been hidden in the casket of the mummies until they were discovered and brought to Joseph Smith 4,000 years later. Parley Pratt also indicated that the papyri, as well as the mummies, were hidden away so that the ravages of time would not destroy them. There could not possibly have been any changes made to the papyri. That was written by Abraham's own hand because it had remained intact and hidden with the facsimiles and the papyri with the mummy for 4,000 years. Notice how the apologists continually have to ignore what Joseph Smith said in order to save him from the ravages of modern Egyptology and our advancement in learning, which has fundamentally demonstrated from an Egyptological point of view that Joseph Smith not only did not understand the history, but he absolutely did not understand the culture nor the Egyptian language. Each of these approaches has its respective strengths and weaknesses, and some may seem more plausible than others, but none on its own can account for all of the available evidence. It's certainly possible, however, that Joseph Smith's explanations may have utilized different approaches of interpretation. In that case, two or more of the previously mentioned methods might be valid simultaneously. They aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. From current available evidence, none of Joseph Smith's explanations of the facsimiles in their entirety agree with how modern Egyptologists understand these images. However, in many instances, they do accurately reflect ancient Egyptian and Semitic concepts. That is simply false. Nothing in the papyri of Joseph Smith's translation in the Book of Abraham, nor any of his explanations, match modern Egyptology. However, in many instances, they do accurately reflect ancient Egyptian and Semitic concepts. So whichever way one approaches the facsimiles, a respectable case can be made that with a number of his explanations, Joseph Smith did indeed capture authentic ancient concepts. Importantly, some of his explanations are remarkably accurate and would have otherwise been beyond his natural ability to know. Any responsible approach to the facsimiles must take this into account. Many of Joseph Smith's interpretations were not accurate. This is simply false. They are trying to say, look what Joseph Smith could not have known, and now we know that he accurately depicted it. That is simply false. Fundamentally so. For this video, we're going to point out a few of the noteworthy instances where Joseph Smith's explanations to the facsimiles find support from modern Egyptology and converge with how the Egyptians understood these images or symbols throughout their history. Beginning with facsimile 1, as interpreted by Joseph Smith, this scene depicts Abraham fastened upon an altar before some idolatrous gods. An idolatrous priest is about to sacrifice Abraham, who is protected by the angel of the Lord. Joseph Smith's interpretation of this scene, sometimes called a lion couch scene due to the prominent lion couch at the center of the illustration, has historically clashed with Egyptological interpretations, which say facsimile 1 is depicting the mummification and resurrection of the god Osiris. However, recent investigation has turned up evidence which suggests a connection between sacred violence and scenes of the embalming, mummification, and resurrection of the god Osiris. And this recent evidence that he brings forth is from the Mormon Egyptologists. Let's make no mistake about this. There is nothing in facsimile number one that was accurately translated or elaborated upon by any current living Egyptologist who agrees with that. They can find none of them unless they are already believing Mormon or Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint Egyptologists. They cannot, they have not, and they will not 
produce their research in valid Egyptological journals when it comes to the papyri and the Book of Abraham for one very simple reason. None of it is accurate. Iris. In 2008 and 2010, for instance, Egyptologist John Gee published evidence linking scenes of Osiris mummification and resurrection in the roof chapels of the Dendera Temple with ritual violence. Why might some ancient Egyptians have associated the resurrection of the god Osiris with ritual violence? It may relate to the classic retelling of an ancient Egyptian myth where Osiris was slain and mutilated by his brother Seth. Through the efforts of his sister wife, the goddess Isis, the body of Osiris was magically reassembled and resurrected. The final vindication came when the god Horus, the son of Osiris and Isis, slew Seth in combat and claimed kingship. The element in this myth of Horus slaying Seth, a god who represented the forces of chaos or disorder, might explain why violence was associated with embalming, mummification, and resurrection in some ancient Egyptian contexts. It is thus reasonable to insist, to quote Guy, that excluding a sacrificial dimension to lion couch scenes is un-Egyptian, even if we cannot come up with one definitive reading of facsimile one at this time. This is entirely misleading. There was no violence with facsimile number one and lion couch scenes in ancient Egyptian. This is John Gee in a desperado move attempting to defend the indefensible. The reason we know that is because Robert K. Rittner, John Gee's professor and chair for his PhD program, at least for the part of the time, has written a thorough response, and he has completely refuted not only John Gee in this instance, but Kerry Mulstein's idea that facsimile number one deals with sacrifice. You notice that he nowhere mentions Robert Rittner. Robert Rittner also was interviewed in a 13 hour long interview on the Mormon Stories podcast with John DeLynn and Radio Free Mormon. And there, Dr. Rittner emphatically declared and showed how his renegade student, John Gee, was entirely not only misreading the Egyptian, but mistranslating the Egyptian hieroglyphics. Kerry Mulstein's attempts to find sacrifice Human sacrifice in ancient Egypt has been entirely refuted. It is fundamentally wrongheaded and misguided for this particular LDS apologist defense of Joseph Smith with the papyri to ignore the anchor weight of Robert Rittner, who was the Western side of the world in the Western Hemisphere, the greatest Egyptologist. There is no support for Joseph Smith and the LDS interpretations of this information. Reasonable to insist, to quote Guy, that excluding thus reasonable to insist, to quote Guy, that excluding Facsimile 2 of the Book of Abraham is an object called a hypocephalus by Egyptologists. The name comes from Greek, meaning literally under the head. Spell 162 of the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead specifies that these amulets were to be placed under or beside the head of the mummy, meaning in some proximity to the deceased. Today, there are just over 160 known hypocephali or objects that functioned as hypocephali that have been cataloged or published. According to Spell 162 of the Book of the Dead, the hypocephalus served a number of important purposes to protect the deceased in the afterlife, to provide light and heat for the deceased, to enable the deceased to be resurrected, and to transform the deceased into a glorified divine being. Hypocephali were also conceived as the magical eye of the sun god Ra that consumed enemies with fire. Their circular shape and function to provide light, heat, and protection naturally lent themselves to this conceptualization in the minds of the ancient Egyptians. Hypocephali were also used as divinatory devices in the Egyptian temple and as astronomical documents. 
they also had a conceptual link with temple gates. In this capacity, they shared a focus on creation motifs and conceptually served, among other things, to keep out enemies and admit the worthy into sacred space. This is especially significant since Joseph Smith's interpretation of facsimile 2 draws connections to the temple and features several astronomical and creation elements. This, to me, was quite interesting, although probably fundamentally irrelevant. I know the ancient mysteries do describe several themes involved with hypocephali. Joseph Smith may have put a meta-narrative onto it. Hypocephali were buried with the dead. They were not studied and passed around and interpreted in the ancient Egyptian temples. They were very personal, private documents that were for the dead only. It is also noteworthy that there appears to have been ancient connections between Abraham and the hypocephalus. For example, in one Egyptian papyrus, Abraham is referred to as the pupil of the Wedjat Eye and associated with the primeval creator god. As explained by one non-Latter-day Saint Egyptologist, the hypocephalus, based on the representations of the primeval creator god Amun in the center panel of the disc, is, according to the ancient Egyptian theory, identical with the pupil of the Wedjat Eye. Looking at some of the individual figures in facsimile 2 reveals a few remarkable instances where Joseph Smith's interpretation finds justifiable support from an Egyptological perspective. are aware that is based on a mistranslation of an Egyptian text. Edward Ashment was refuting John Gee's interpretation there as well as his discussion of a lion couch in the Greek magical papyri. So I don't think that's entirely valid. The other thing I do note is that the gross misuse and the false impression left by using the Egyptologist Mechus. I have a colleague on Shade's message board that I am in communication with weekly who knows the Egyptologist Mechus very well. They're good friends. They communicate at least monthly. And there is not one item in Joseph Smith's interpretations of facsimile number two that Dr. Mechus has agreed with. In light of the linkage with Abraham and the facsimile, that is wishful thinking from a valid Egyptologist. Notice the impression left here is a almost a side note of the link of the wedgeot eye with the hypocephalus having nothing at all to do with any of Joseph Smith's interpretations, and yet they will use an Egyptologist for that. And yet they ignore the fundamental terrible way the fatally flawed way, Joseph Smith made his incomplete hypocephalus look complete. I produced eight videos on the Joseph Smith papyri and the relationships of the facsimiles, all three of them. Number two definitely was a hodgepodge taken from the Book of Breathings, a text that has absolutely no relationship whatsoever with the hypocephalus, Joseph Smith was putting in texts upside down. He was misinterpreting several figures and characteristics of the hypocephalus. No, this video is entirely misleading. There is no reference of Robert Rittner, again, the most complete book on the Joseph Smith hypocephalus, where Rittner agrees with very precious little perhaps one item, which, of course, the apologists are quick to jump on, but he disagrees with all the rest of the 15 or 16 items. Notice how the apologists appear to make it seem like it is magnified in potential truth because they can quote Mechus as an Egyptologist on one peripheral point that has nothing to do with Joseph Smith's translation. And they will quote Robert Rittner here coming up shortly, one item out of 15 or 16, whereas otherwise on every single one of the facsimiles, number one, number two, and number three, Robert Rittner eviscerates the Egyptology of John Gee, 
of Kerry Mulstein, of Michael Dennis Rhodes, and of Hugh Nibley. None of this is ever mentioned. Robert Rittner not only wrote the definitive text, he wrote two scholarly articles in the Journal of Near Eastern Studies, and then in Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought, as well as when the church historical essay on the Book of Abraham was put on the church's official internet website, Robert Rittner also responded to that point by point and demonstrated the fallacious character and the misreadings and the gross misunderstandings of not only ancient Egyptian religious thought, but of their history, their iconography, and their symbolism. No, for Book of Mormon Central to produce this type of shoddy scholarship, even though it looks fabulous, they put together a very nice-looking little presentation. The knowledge in this is 100% in entirely unreasonable and unreliable. Let's go to the next video clip. I hope this is it. I've got to grab it. Oh, I've got to remove this one first. Sorry. I have to remove that from the studio. I will remove these from the studio, and then I can get on with the next few video clips. I actually, uh, I'm only allowed 10 video clips, and I understand it. I get it. There's only so much space, but I, I felt it really important to respond to these in quite some detail because the mischaracterizations are absolutely horrendous. Six, nine, 10, 11, 12. Hopefully that's my next one. Uh, the misrepresentations are just not accurate. This is not valid scholarship, folks. This is just not valid scholarship. Now, this shows the difference again, and I've said it many times in my series of videos, which, of course, the apologists are entirely ignoring, getting clear on the Joseph Smith papyri. I think I put up like a dozen of them in detail where they are completely ignoring them because they don't say what they hope will demonstrate Joseph Smith to be a true prophet. Based on his ignorance of Egyptology, that doesn't work. It is also noteworthy that there appears to have been ancient connections between Abraham and the hypocephalus. For example, in one Egyptian... This interpretation finds ready support from the ancient Egyptians, as the four entities in figure six represent the four sons of the god Horus, who were associated with the cardinal points. As one Egyptologist put it, by virtue of its association with the cardinal directions, four is the most common symbol of completeness in Egyptian numerological symbolism and ritual repetition. Egypt Again, we see the really serious fatal flaw of leaving the impression that Robert Rittner is in full support of Joseph Smith's interpretation, that is simply not how Robert Rittner described it in any of his books or any of his articles whatsoever. Let me get this next one, 3, 6, 9, 12, 13, I believe this is the one. Yes, it is. Because Joseph Smith's explanation to figure seven in facsimile two has proven to be especially controversial, it's worth exploring in depth to show how the prophet's interpretation actually makes some sense. This figure is identified by Joseph Smith as God sitting upon his throne, revealing through the heavens the grand keywords of the priesthood, as also the sign of the Holy Ghost unto Abraham in the form of a dove. Appearing in several other ancient Egyptian hypocephali, the sitting personage in figure seven has been described by one Egyptologist as a polymorphic god sitting on his throne. The back of him is bird form, while one of his arms is raised in the attribution of the gods Min or Amun and holding a flagellum. In some hypocephali, the ancient Egyptians themselves identified this figure as variously the great god, the lord of life, or the lord of all. Although he assumed multiple attributes over millennia and was often syncretized with the gods Horus and Amun, the god Min is best known as the god of the regenerative, procreative forces of nature.
again, the, the defect with this is Joseph Smith's Christian interpretation of the Holy Ghost in the form of a dove, some of his generality theme descriptions of this particular God is completely off base. There's nothing Christian here at all. And so this type of an analysis, what they're doing, it appears that they are desperate because they are desperate. When you take the full context of all of the usages of men together, it just doesn't equal what Joseph Smith described in that short epithet. Let me see if I have, I think I have one or two more. I will just end with two more. I will just share these two. Uh, I think I'm skipping one. I apologize. Recently, I one scholar performed a study of facsimile three by comparing it with similar throne scenes depicting the god Osiris from extant copies of the ancient Egyptian Book of Breathings, which is the funerary text facsimile three originally appeared next to on the papyri. When compared with other throne scenes from the Book of Breathings, Facsimile 3 contains many anomalous artistic elements that are not standard in other illustrations. Even its original placement on the papyrus scroll is likewise not standard for this type of text. Rather than being a standard judgment scene, Facsimile 3 more closely parallels what's known as a presentation scene. And again, they have entirely ignored Dan Vogel's book on this. Book of Abraham Apologetics, a review and the critique. Now, I'm not sure when they made this video, so it may have been before Vogel uh, wrote his book. His book is 2021, so that would be valid. That would be a valid, I'm an anachronism in that respect. The context, here he is utilizing John Gee's context. The amazing thing that happens is that Robert Rittner, in his text, The Joseph Smith Egyptian Papyri, and in several of his articles, has shown that every single time John Gee has found some type of a parallel that helps confirm Joseph Smith, both John Gee and Kerry Mulstein are taking things out of context. They are misinterpreting it. They are taking a text from this particular region of time and place and another text here, and they are splicing them together in a grossly incompetent and completely out of context manner. Robert Rittner has taken the apologists to the length of their obfuscation and misuse of Egyptian papyri, mythology, religion, and history. Every time there is a parallel, you need to go to Robert Rittner to find the refutation. And finally, one last presentation that I will share with you before I close out. Its original placement on the papyrus scroll is likewise not standard for this type of text. Rather than being a standard judgment scene, facsimile 3 more closely parallels what's known as a presentation scene, which features the deceased being introduced into the presence of Osiris by one or more other Egyptian deities. If facsimile 3 is indeed closer to a presentation scene than a judgment scene, then it might have a plausible connection with astronomy. As John Gee has noted, parallel scenes on Egyptian temples are explicitly labeled as initiations. Known initiation rituals from Greco-Roman Egypt include instruction in astronomy as part of the initiation. This converges with Joseph Smith's interpretation that facsimile 3 depicts Abraham reasoning upon the principles of astronomy in the king's court. There's a lot more that could be said about the facsimiles of the Book of Abraham. No, there are not. <laughs> this astronomical situation is simply modern John Gee trying to ignore the entire context of facsimile number three to build up a, a new meaning in order to match with Joseph Smith. The problem with this is we know Joseph Smith put the provenance at 4000 BC. You will notice I pretty much covered the entire video. They never want once mentioned Joseph Smith, Wilford Woodruff, or the Pratt brothers and their discussion 
of the provenance of the papyri written by his own hand upon papyrus. Now they're trying to put it way later into the times when the papyri Egyptologically have been verifiably dated to Ptolemaic times. This is the reason why the apologists have taken to studying that era because they're trying to save Joseph Smith from himself. If the papyri date from Ptolemaic times, and they do, then Joseph Smith was simply wrong in claiming a revelation that Abraham himself wrote these papyri. That's the elephant in the room that the Egyptologists are ignoring. They are performing a very clever, sometimes very beautiful presentation like this one, sleight of hand, where they are taking our eyes off the prize that Joseph Smith did not translate the papyri accurately from Egyptian hieroglyphics, and he did not explain the explanations at all for either facsimile one, two, or three. And in fact, he misdrew the god Anubis in facsimile number one. It wasn't a bald priest. It was Anubis, the jackal-headed deity. All of these have led to me no longer being an apologist for the Joseph Smith Book of Abraham because it is fatally flawed again, again, and again, again, and again, and again. So thanks for watching my first recording. I will return with more responses and more analysis of the Mormon apologists as they keep producing their misguided materials.